Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Deep in the Plus. I'm your host, Rob Whiteside. Thank you, as always, for being with us. We really appreciate you. If you have not already, please subscribe to WDWNT-TV and uh, give this video a thumbs up. I think, uh, I think you'll enjoy tonight. A lot of times I say we have a very special show for you, but boy, howdy, it's a super special show. And I'm going to start with my co-host here, Mr. Patrick Hackett. How are you, sir? Hey, I am doing fantastic. I am so excited right now. Oh, man, what, I just love revisiting the classics. This is one of my favorite parts of Deep in the Plus. Absolutely. And then we are very fortunate to have with us, we're going to be talking about Escape to Witch Mountain. And nobody better to know about Escape to Witch Mountain than Tony himself, Mr. Ike Eisenman. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thank you. Um, Thank you for being with us, sir. We appreciate it. We're oh, excited. man. You're welcome. I'm super honored. Thank you for, for having me. This is, uh, this is fantastic. So uh, Escape to Witch Mountain was one of those movies that as I was a kid, you know, uh, and children who are watching, please know that you couldn't always go and stream a movie. You couldn't go <laughs> and rent a movie at Blockbuster. Yeah. You couldn't burn a movie. You actually had to go to the theaters to see a movie you wanted to see. And I know that, you know, in the Disney catalog, a lot of times they would re-release things into the theater. I'm sure I saw this on a re-release. It was originally released in 1975. Um, but I just loved the experience of those movies in the 70s in general. And the 70s were a huge time for Disney. It may just be because I'm old, but I feel like the, the, the 70s were like a classic time for Disney movies. And I think back and I'm looking at a list like The Aristocats, Million Dollar Duck, uh, Now You See Him, Now You Don't, the whole Kurt Russell trilogy that they had, uh, Herbie the Love Bug, all that kind of stuff, and Escape to Witch Mountain and uh, Return from Witch Mountain are both in there. So um, I, when you got this gig, and let me just start with that, when you got this gig, did you realize that you were going to be part of something, it may be a cheesy question, I apologize, but if you were going to be part of something so big, it's not a cheesy question. I hoped I would be, um, but you know, one never knows. Um, Escape to Witch Mountain was the first movie that um, that I that I got. I had done a lot, a, a fair amount of television prior prior to it, but it being a Disney movie, there was always the you know the the, the possibility it was going to be something special. But it was a very different kind of Disney movie. Even when we made it, we weren't you know entirely sure what it was going to be like or how it was going to be received. Um, I was super excited to do it. I loved the story when I read the screenplay. I actually read the book because it is based upon a book. Um, and um, I, I, I thought, at least in my mind, it was going to be something special. But always, you start to sort of learn over time in Hollywood that, that you, you work on a project, it has its life, it comes out, it either turns into something or it doesn't turn into something. And, you know, thankfully for, I think for, I think for all of us, I, you know, it's a, it's a well-loved movie. It's, it's a, it's a Disney classic now. And, and I, um, I certainly enjoy it as much as the fans do. And I'm so glad it actually did turn into <laughs> into something that had, uh, had some longevity and, and uh, something that people really, really cared about. Yeah. Well, I mean, Rob and I talk about the Herbie series a lot and how after Fully Loaded, it didn't really come back. But you also had that nice reboot with uh, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, and one of the films for him. Plus, when I told my wife, I was like, I'm talking to one of the stars of Escape to Witch Mountain. She did think Eric Von Detten was coming on because that's what she grew up with. She grew up with that version. Ah, <laughs> And yes, actually, I got I to be honest with you. I've never seen it. I have, I have actually ne never seen it. Um, I keep intending to try to find it just to see to see what it what it was, but it's not quite happened yet. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you, you know, you mentioned it was based on a book, uh, and then, you, yeah. of course, the first movie happened, and then Return, to Witch Ma or Return from Witch Mountain happened, um, you know, in 1978. So, uh, but you, uh, you guys uh, did a lot of movies together, didn't you, or quite a few? Who, Ki uh, Kim and I? Yeah, you and Kim. Sorry. Well, we, yeah, we did. We did the, the, the ultimately, the three Witch Mountain films, um, but... Strangely enough, and uh, we, we both got cast in a TV horror movie called Devil Dog Count from Hell. And um, that was that was a couple, a, a couple of years after uh, Return from Witch Mountain um, was released. And 
we both just I, I we, we we had no idea the other one got cast. We showed up to work for work, and all of a sudden I see I know I've got a sister who's being cast. I didn't know who it was. She's there, and all of a sudden we look at each other and we start laughing, and um, we kind of wanted to ask the producers if they had. We actually did. We ended up asking someone if they had any idea that 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 we had already starred together in two other movies, especially Disney movies, and they had absolutely no idea. So <laughs> it was really quite funny, and that was just a testament to how much Kim and I looked alike. Because I remember yeah. meeting when I when I met her for the first time on the screen test for uh, for Escape uh, Escape to Witch Mountain. I, I knew her from Andy the Professor. I knew her work. I was familiar with her. But the second I looked at her and we're standing there facing each other, I just was like, good grief. If, there, anybody, if anybody was going to play my sister, it's this girl. We look so much alike. Well, so that's, <laughs> that ended up carrying Even on. in the picture over here, I mean, it's astounding. The hair parts <laughs> the same way. The freckle patterns almost exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. It's incredible. It's really incredible. But yeah, so I would say that the, the, those were the four things we did together, the three Witch Mountain projects and then uh, De Devil Dog Hound of Hell. So, you know, put that on your shelf somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I was looking at it. I mean, there's uh, yeah, it's, it definitely is interesting. I haven't watched it, but I guess I'll give it a watch. There are a lot of other things that you were in, like Emergency and some of those things in the 70s that I was like, you know, these are things my parents watched. And I was just like, huh, how about that? So, yeah. I mean. The, that's that's it's a great resume and I'm uh, again we're really really thankful for you coming on the show tonight um, one of the things that that happens in this movie is that you know this is one of those again those quintessential 1970s Disney movies and um, the trailer on Disney plus is not the real trailer I went back and looked at the real trailer the real trailer it has I, I believe that might be Don LaFontaine who does it um, but it's that that old school Disney productions proudly you know you know production of escape to witch mountain and then it's just like it gives me those vibes from the great movie ride and the mary poppins trailer and things like that um and that puts me like right back into that mindset with it but this movie um when it came out was kind of the superhero movie of its time um you know we didn't you know it, kids with powers uh you know, yes. kind of pre-x-men things like that there wasn't really at the time a superman or you know it's after the adam west cheesy batman all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, to me, I think that's what uh, appealed to me about this as a kid is that it was like, oh my gosh, these are kids with superpowers, really. Yeah, I, and and that was the thing I think I was I was certainly the most excited about when I got the film because, you know, for me, just a little backstory in terms of my career, I I had been like hoping, wishing, dreaming, and praying that I could do a Disney project because I love Disney movies. I love the magic about Disney movies, all the special effects and everything. And um, and so I, I was something that I really, really, really wanted to do. So when I got this film, I was terribly excited. And auditioning for it, I had no idea what it was because Disney was, they were very interesting and kind of mysterious about their casting process. They wouldn't uh, necessarily tell you what the project was. They wouldn't give you a title. You didn't know what it was about. You just had um you just had and i'm sorry if these pings are going on right now um i'm hearing them i hope you're not anyway um anyway i so when i got it and then i read the script i was overwhelmed because i thought it was going to be the most fun most amazing thing to be able to work on given all the special effects and all the special powers that tony and tia had and all the things that we were going to get to participate in from that magical disney perspective and I, 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 I was thrilled over that. So I think your assessment is absolutely right. That's the kind of the funny thing about it is we're being chased down and trying to be controlled by adults um, in the world that think they have some kind of power over you. And we're just sitting back and laughing and saying, yeah, not, nah, not pretty much not a chance. <laughs> well, and this brings was... up something that, I, that Patrick texted me last night. I was going to read that. He said, <laughs> this blank is intense. And, and I think that, like, Patrick, so you said it was intense. What did you mean by intense, buddy? Yeah. So I've, I've seen this movie before. Um, Wide World of Disney, I remember coming on frequently. But I think I've confused this and bed knobs and broomsticks in my head. <laughs> oh, and oh so, I get like, it. I get when, it. When all of a sudden 
I'm like, there's you're chasing kids with guns in a Disney movie. I'm like, what is going on here? Now that's a. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, that's a that's great point. Job. It's it's something that I, it, it it only occurred to me much later, and and, and I just to mention this, I've written a memoir about my career, and of course a lot of it has to do with this movie. But I know as I was watching the movie over and over and over again to refamiliarize myself with a lot of it. I all of a sudden looked and I said, you know what? These kids are actually threatening um, these grownups with an actual, you know, 38, 38 special gun um, through telekinesis. And I thought this doesn't really happen in Disney movies. So it was kind of, it was fascinating to me. Yeah. Just, just to look back at it from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, I was looking at the chat and somebody said that it said we had escape on laser disc. Awesome. I'm jealous <laughs> about that. That's yeah, that's that's like the one format in my life I think I missed out on was Laserdisc, but it's fun. It's all good. So you yeah. mentioned all the special effects and I'm a big reader of IMDb and I always go to the trivia page. It never helps me with the trivia that Rob will eventually give me. Yep. But one of the trivia there is that in one of the early scenes where Trunk hits the bat, he hit it so hard it went into your face. Yes, that is absolutely true. You can see it if you. It's, it's um, the shot. Yeah, it is. It's well. Yeah. It was the it it was the only shot we did because it did hit me in the face, and we had to stop oh. production for a few hours um, as my black eyes swelled up, and they had to put makeup on it. It was it, it was a particularly delicate special effect that, you know, with 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 all the you know the big adult brains who have worked on these things so many times and does have they've done all these. Of course, there were analog effects in those days, which means everything was hanging from wires. It was all happening live on, on, on set. That baseball bat was lifted by two pieces of fishing line and held, you know, it was supposed to come up right in front of my face. And Dermot Downs, the actor who played truck, was supposed to pull his punch, you know, not get close to it, but not, you know, anywhere near it. And, um, and we rehearsed it many, many times. And it all seemed to work okay in rehearsals, but then when the anxiousness of an actual take came up, he got so excited that he stepped in and actually hit the bat, which he wasn't supposed to do. And boy, that bat just was just hanging by wires and it's right here, popped me right in the face. And yeah. so that's a legit real reaction. That's yeah. not acting right there. No. It, you know, shocked me, knocked me back. And, and if yeah. you watch the film very, very carefully, you can see, especially in the, um, you know, in 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 the um, restored digital versions of the film, you can see I've got I've definitely got a shiner under there. There's makeup on on my face for the subsequent scenes. Thankfully, it didn't it didn't cause any over swelling or a you know a swollen black eye that meant we would have had to shut down for um, you know for a number of days. But uh, but yeah, it ended up working out. It was a little painful, a little uncomfortable, but you know, hey, the shot's you, great. You do what you got to you do what you got to do. <laughs> Yeah, as a as a former professional wrestler, when I saw that scene, I was like, ah, somebody did not pull their punch, and I'm like, it hit him, it hit him right in the face, and that's yeah. the the shot that they took. Wow, look at you, yeah. a champion for your art. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a I have a random question, and you're gonna think this may be the dumbest question that you ever heard in your entire life. When the movie opens, it's opening credits, and it's the it's mm -hmm. this sort of silhouettes of the kids running through the woods did you guys do that or did they have somebody else do that that's interesting someone else asked about that on social media and i thought that was very interesting i some of the shots are kim and i and some of them are not and i don't know who they used or when they shot some of it but um we did shoot a lot of running like running quote unquote escaping shots from the from Aristotle Bolt's mansion that were never used in the film. There are some scenes that weren't used. They just cut it down for time. It was probably superfluous once they realized they didn't really didn't need it. So I think they used that material partially and rotoscoped us into the opening sequence. But I definitely know there's some shots there that are not Kim and I. I just and I, I don't know in post production if they if they did that to flesh out the opening sequence or title sequence or or not. But yeah. Very cool. I just again, I just as I'm watching this, and I'm like, well, you know what? I can ask the man. I can ask the man himself. We'll figure out <laughs> figure out if that's a thing. 
Uh, and yeah. then when the movie actually opens, it goes into, you know, we meet the, the kids for the first time and we can see that they're headed to an orphanage. Uh, and then we learn by them filling out their own paperwork. Is that something that we think happens at an <laughs> orphanage that kids have to fill out their own, like, admission paperwork? I don't, I don't know. But anyway, so they're filling out their own paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there there are some interesting anachronisms in the movie for sure. I don't know that you actually do just sit down and fill paperwork out before you, you know, you you enter an orphanage. I, I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, they're signing in. They meet Truck, uh, kind of the bully of the orphanage. He steals Tia's pen. Tony like steps up for her, but in, and then ends up they they get the pin back, uh, and then we see them playing baseball, and that's the scene that Patrick was talking about, and that's like that's you guys yeah. like or the characters using their powers for the very first time, um, and when I think about the powers, I think about I probably as a kid did this a lot. I probably put my hands <laughs> to my temple, and just thought as hard as I could uh, to try to move things, you know, then, in, you know, then later in, uh, it was the force, but, you know, probably started with of that course, to yeah. try to figure things out. Um, but then we see the powers. And so I don't know, Patrick, did, did you feel more comfortable with the kids once they had powers and could de defend themselves or was it still too intense for you? No, I was really sucked into the fiction pretty quickly because I'm like, oh, this is, this is a Disney story. Kids got no parents. Kids caretakers are gone. And now they're out on their own. And I'm, I'm constantly searching my memory to see if I remember where it goes. And then I'm watching. I was literally on the edge of my seat. I dip, So Rob's going to do trivia later and I'm going to do very poorly. Um, because I stopped taking notes and I was really paying attention because it sucked me in so well. And I think that's one of the best things about, um, Rob mentioned the 70s movies. They really have this ability to suck you in because I feel they're a little more timeless than some of the films in the 80s because the 80s often look like 80s films. I think the 70s, they have that very classic look. I mean, even when we're talking about the opening credits of this, that's very classic. And it just, it pulls you in. Um, I was I was trying to figure out what was going to happen. And then when we get to the show first scene, I'm like, wait, that's another power. Well, mm -hmm. and you were talking about confusing it. I kind of confused it with sort of like a, uh, like a Close Encounters. I felt like there was a lot more, uh, like, I don't know, sci-fi to it than it was. But it was really kind of, I mean, at its heart, it's kind of a, just a down-to-earth story, uh, like about the kids yeah. trying to get home. Yeah, very much. I mean, I, it's, a, it's, it's a, you know, it's an outsider story. It's a coming of age story. It's a discovering who you are story that I think is what made it resonate so much with so many children and, you know, across generations, because I still to this day have, you know, families and parents who, who share the movie with their kids and they like it a lot. Um, it's almost going into the, you know, the, even the next generation and, and, and grandkids are, are watching it because the, the, you know the themes are 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 pretty powerful. You know, e even to me, even though I was I I was in it. It's you know, children. So many young children feel powerless in their in their lives and are trying to figure out who they are. You know, and you know what more magical thing could you could you have to discover than than you are you know that you are special in a in a powerful way where you can you can take care of yourself, protect yourself. And then you can find, then you find your own place in the world at the end, you know? So I'm, you know, I, I think that's part of what's made it, uh, you know, really turned it into, into a, a classic. So let, I agree hundred percent. Let me ask you this question because again, rewatching the movie, I, I had a lot of feelings of how I felt about the powers themselves because they do a great mm -hmm. job in the storytelling of letting us know what the powers are as the kids do. Like they don't always know their own power and they're learning them and what they can do and they're telling us and, and I've had a lot of kind of sort of complaints about some modern stuff that like they have to over explain in exposition. Here it's the two kids in conversation figuring out on their own and we're kind of slowly learning what they do so i think that's cool but like i was confused i think like with tony when he jumps out of the way or uh, of the of the bat <laughs> mm -hmm. whether he whether he got hit or not but it jumps out of the way of the bat <laughs> um so when he, when he jumps out I, I feel like that was his power because i don't think that tia was controlling that she controlled it when he jumped up high 
And so I think mm-hmm. I guess he had limited amounts of powers. But I think as a kid, as a as a as a boy, I was upset that he used his harmonica and he couldn't just like do the powers like she could. And, and oh, I like, love that. But do you do you feel like that was like are? Uh, and and then she could talk inside her head, but he had to talk out loud. Like yeah. I, I'm not I'm not trying to insult your power, sir. I really am not, and I'm sure you're very powerful. Not at but... all. You know, I don't take it personally because that's how the script was written and the story was told. So I had nothing to do with that. But you sure. know, it, it's it, there's that funny moment in um in the scene where I where Tony is playing his harmonica and he's manipulating the marionettes and. And they do have a little exchange where he basically they, they go back and forth about it. So so we were talking about the power thing. And I think Patrick misunderstood me because I was like, I don't not saying that the harmonica thing wasn't cool, but I just thought that I felt like, you know, that his his powers, her, she seemed to have the lion's share of the powers, I guess is what I was saying. Yeah. Well, you know. Don't don't all women. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, no, she... in, in the uh, in the book though, she's mute, and the star case that she has holds paper and pen, so she can write things to him all the time. So maybe yeah, that's why they gave her the the inner monologue. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let me ask you this: uh, You, Patrick, Patrick was saying that he had read that you had learned to play harmonica, and then they dubbed it over you. Is that is that real? No, I didn't really learn to play the harmonica, but I was very stressed out. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. No, no, no. I'll take that um, IMDb I, trivia. I, I, was very, I was very anxious because I saw that my character was going to have to play the harmonica, so I was worried that I needed to learn how. So my mother took me to a music store. I bought one. It had a little pamphlet in it that, that, that kind of gave you the, the very basics on how to play the harmonica. So... I learned to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star very poorly. That was the only thing I knew how to play. And no one told me that I didn't need to know how to play, that it was all going to be done later until I got on set. And finally, John Huff, the director, said, no, no, I, you just, you're just blowing, you know, blowing notes here or there. You can just pretend. We've got some music. You can kind of pretend you're playing along with it. Um, but what's funny is you can't really pretend to play harmonica. You've got to blow into it. So on set, I was just making horrendous, horrendous sounds, um, you know, but it all ended up working. You know, of course, of course, they, they were going to have someone else do it when, it when it was necessary. But most of it was just like, you know, just blowing long notes to. And, you know, it, it was what is even odder about that to me is by the time we did return from which mountains so for some reason i no longer tony no longer needed a harmonica to do what he could do it was like somehow he grew, grew up enough that you know well yeah. you don't need an instrument anymore i was just really grateful it wasn't a tuba or something like that that would have been <laughs> you know cumbersome to have to carry around <laughs> the recorder just playing hot cross buns yeah yeah well and by the way you were quite an artist with that uh, harmonica that that cathedral uh, that you drew of a house uh, you know, with the marker and the harmonica, I, I, it's supposed mm. to be a crown, but it looks like it was a marker just because of the way that it flawlessly yeah. wrote on the mirror, etc. Um, you know, but I, I think we've talked about this before with anything. I have I have great suspension of disbelief if I know the rules. You know, like mm-hmm. the whole thing with like Superman flying. I totally buy it because I know the rules and what he can do and what he can't do. And the same thing, you know, when it comes to superheroes and the same thing here is like as long as I know the rules. And again, I feel like they establish the, the rules pretty early, except for, you know, like I said, like him. There were a couple things he did, like when he levitated up in the jail to look mm-hmm. through the bars, he wasn't using his harmonica. And that was him doing that, it seemed to be. So, you know, there yeah. was there there was some powers that he had. Although, I, you know, I know we're skipping ahead, so I won't get to that scene yet. But I do have some questions about the scene with the mop and the, and the, the jacket fighting with the sheriff. Oh, sure. That, that, I, I have a lot of questions. I mean, we're, we're covering kind of the whole movie. But how was it working with the technology of that time? Because we, we see today, you know, actors are acting in front of a tennis ball on a pole. And I was watching that. I'm like, there's definitely early cgi in this film and i'm wondering was it green screen was it wires what were you looking at that you had to react to and act to while all these powers were going on well it was all analog everything was done on set um the only and disney doesn't disney at that time did not use a green screen process they used what was called um a sodium stage they had a proprietary uh 
photographic effects stage with a different color screen in the background. And that was used for the, um, the Winnebago, the helicopter, uh, scenes like that. But all of the, all of the actual effects were, were practical effects. They were done on set. And I will describe the most complicated one to you because to me, it's the most fascinating. It was the most fun for me to do. And it's in that very scene you're talking about in the jail cell when um, Tony's harmonica is in with the sheriff sitting up on a shelf and he says to Tia, you need to, I need, I'm going to need my harmonica to do this. And so she is the one who actually levitates the harmonica and, and makes it fly along uh, down through the hallway and, um, and then through the bars of the jail cell and I pluck it out of the air. Um, well, that was all done. All, all of those floating effects, everything from the gun to the harmonica to even the, uh, the puppet, uh, the marionettes dancing, uh, they, they made use of fishing line, very thin fishing line. Everything was attached to, and it was just, it just flows. They, they, they had someone above the set with a, with a, with a armature holding the harmonica and it, flew along and down and actually no that one they didn't use an armature it was actually hanging um from sorry I, i'm getting getting it mixed up with something else the marionettes were b being operated above the set with their armatures connected to oh very good great graphic perfect timing um they they were being controlled by the puppeteers above the set with fishing line connected to all of the actual control surfaces to operate the puppets but for this one, where the harmonica moves down the hallway, it was hanging on two pieces of fishing line that were threaded onto a very tightly, um, tightly held in place guideline and pulled along by another piece of fishing line by a special effects artist around this corner and down, down the hallway and then through the bars. And then when it got inside the cell, I then grabbed it and took hold of it and basically broke the entire rig apart um, in the process to make the take work. So it had to be reset every time. We did four takes. Oh. And it took us an hour and a half to do it because it took about 20 to 30 minutes to reset up for each take. Because part of that process not only was rehanging all the lines that this that the harmonic had to move through move along, but the special effects artist had this tray of of paints, little Dixie cups full of all these different colors of paint that were all on the set, all the shadows, all the highlights, the wall colors, the everything. And they called, he, um, Hal, Hal was his name, Hal, I forgot his last, Hal Bigham, I forgot his last name. Anyway, Hal was the lead special effects artist and he coined this phrase for this process, he, he called it Moneting all of the uh, all, all the lines it was like monet's dappling you know very uh, brush strokey kind of process where he would take q-tips and he would from the camera's point of view he would look down at all where all the wires were hanging all wow. the fish line was hanging and he would paint all the lines with all the various colors everywhere it moved along so this this was a very long extensive process to set up for it and at the end of every take I tore the whole thing apart you know and plucking it out of the air um, but that was part of that was that was part of what made that shot work and of course in yeah. the digital version of it now the higher resolution um, versions of the film that you see you can pick up you can kind of see the the fishing line and and all, all everything that's pretty much used to manipulate the effects in the film when it was first released in the movie theaters it was very hard to see even up on a big oh, screen yeah. so it was it was extremely effective but that's what made it all so much fun to be a part of and you know part, part of my job was to you know yeah i have to aggressively go ahead and pull that thing out of the air because that's what sold the effect that's what really made it made it seem real as i was plucking it out of thin air and you know and then carrying on um with the action so that's just one example all the other effects were basically a um, a variation on that um, on that practical analog uh, idea. Well, and all the people in our chat are just glorifying how much they love practical effects. I mean, th there's an art to it. Yeah. Absolutely, there's an art to yeah. to making that happen. Much so, I mean, there is some to digital effects as well, but it's just the work that goes into it and the stories that we're hearing. That's just it's amazing to 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 think about all of the things they had to figure out um, yeah. to pull it off.
Yeah. So, yeah. And it was um, fun to do. It was fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm seems sure. That way. <laughs> so this this is completely random, but based on that marionette scene, because the marionette scene, and again, we kind of, so the way that we get to the marionette scene is that that the kids are in the orphanage. They go, for some reason, on a field trip. Again, this one, along with them signing in to themselves into the orphanage, the, the, the orphanage going on a field trip to see a movie seems a little bit out of realm, but it was nice that they did, and they went to see <laughs> Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. You know, of that course. was nice. Um, that's when they see... Uh, Uncle Lucas uh, across the street, uh, you know, he's going to get hit. We learn about Tia's, like, you know, her, her premonition uh, power about making sure that, you know, about seeing the future. And she saves him. Then he just happens to work for some evil man uh, that Aristotle, Aristotle Bolt. Who is, Bolt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what just a the name. name. Yeah. What a uh, name. And who is in every. The... Go ahead. Every actor they have that played a bad guy looked so much like a bad guy it that, was okay. beautiful all right okay all right wait so so yeah you're right and and like one of them was literally a bond villain so i mean you know yeah, that's yeah. that's a thing so mm. let me ask you about that ike cuz that's one of the i got to ask ike this question thing were you intimidated by these actors mm. I, I mean like just because they were playing such evil parts were you intimidated them as people when you were on the set with them or, or, you know, as a kid, or was it just like, these are just people I work with and they were super nice uh, to you outside of it? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much how it was. They, they um, Ray Milan was not at all uh, the intimidating, um, mean, uh, mean, vicious character that he played. He was really a, a lovely man. So was Donald Pleasance. Donald Pleasance was one of the most interesting characters I um, Matt, let alone character actors, but I, I, you know, having already spent some time in the business, at least about a year and a half, I'd, I'd worked with a lot of big TV stars, so I was, I was very comfortable being in the presence of and working with people that I watched and and admired, and I was aware of who Ray Milan was. I'd seen a number of his movies on television. I knew who Donald Pleasance was, and um, it was just fun and exciting to meet them in real life and 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 work with them and. They, they, so there was no intimidation factor whatsoever. We, we were very comfortable with each other on set. They treated Kim and I just like any other actor, um, adult or otherwise, uh, on, on set, which made it very easy for us and, um, very inviting and, and, and very comfortable. And they, and, and, and so, yeah, no, I, you know, I don't think I ever really had an, uh, in incidents, uh, you know, other than working with, with Betty Davis, which you may or may not ask me about later, who, who really was intimidating. She was vastly, incredibly intimidating because she was such a massive star and I was older and a little, knew a little bit more about her reputation in the business, but she was one of the very few people and, and, and there was nothing to the intimidation. You know, it's just, it's just, that's her, that was her rep. Air. It had nothing to do with really yeah. who she was. So, um, actually working this, with these people was, was very revealing and comfortable, comforting in the fact that it didn't matter what, how big a star they were, we're all there, there to do our job. And, and, um, we all did the best, our best to, to make it fun when, you know, a lot of times it's not, you know, conditions are not always so great. Some of the scenes are hot or difficult or frustrating. And, a bear. and so they all, you know, they all know how to make it as easy as, as, as possible. Oh, Rob, did you go now? Oh, I'm the I'm the only no, one. I'm undefeated. No. I know. I know. Yeah, you yeah. are. My gosh, okay, that was that was a, that was a that was a manual ga uh, gaff though. I I turned off the microphone because I was looking something up. So, um, when when the marionette scene is one of those things that stands out to me again is like one of the things I remember most as watching this as a kid. So, uh, when I was looking at that. Uh, and I was remembering that scene. I thought that was great. And then as I looked into this, I saw that there was a Witch Mountain comic book that <laughs> had come out at the time. And I was like, yeah. well, I have to have that. And so I actually did order it. Uh, I didn't have it at the time, but I will in a couple of days. Um, and yeah. then in, in that, they recreate that scene so ah, beautifully, I yeah. feel like. So when you see, you know, I mean, she's, <laughs> wow. got, her star, Very she's good. got her star case. And, yeah, and really well done. And, yeah, right? So, I mean, I was really impressed by that, and I can't wait to get my hands on that comic book. So, um, but anyway, they, I don't uh, have it. Oh, you don't? How could you not? I know. I have a friend. I have a friend who does. I don't have. 
I have a friend who actually <laughs> um, in LA who has probably got the most extensive Witch Mountain collection of anyone, and the comic book is part of it. And I've looked through it, but I have uh, I've not picked up my own copy yet. So <laughs> that I, I'd be careful there, uh, Ike. That sounds like one of those situations where they bring you out and then they ask you to step into a case. And then they're like, now my collection is complete. I have everything. I have Tony. <laughs> and you turn over to the yeah. right, and there's Kim. She's standing there, and it's like, yeah. Oh well, <laughs> this is what we do now. I, um, I would love to see. Um, oh my God, what's that prop show on Disney Plus that they uh, do? Prop culture. I, I think that would be great to see. prop culture. I think it would be great to see you on there looking at some of the old stuff. Uh, that's one of my favorite things when when it first came on, and I think. This movie is really like a cultural touchstone. When I started talking about it, the amount of people that knew about it and were excited, like, again, I just mentioned, you know, my time in professional wrestling, one of the greatest photographers that I worked with in professional wrestling messaged me and was like, I'm such a big fan and, and is in here watching. You know, we got three years. We got a 50th anniversary of this film coming up. I would really like to see um, so, some more. I think prop culture would be a great starting place for it. You know, and, and that kind of leads me to uh, when I was looking up stuff that – and I, I hope that's not weird that we've been, like, checking up on you. Um, but, <laughs> but but one of the things is you, you host a pop culture retro podcast, which yes. I was I was like, this, this thing is exactly in my wheelhouse, uh, pop culture retro podcast. And it's uh, Ike Eisenman and uh, author Jonathan Rosen. And I started watching a couple episodes, and – I'm just like this is my new addiction, sir. This is this is fun stuff. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah, I've got my T-shirt on, um, shamelessly promoting it. Of course, it's fun. We have a great time. We have a great time. We've been very fortunate to um, get to talk to some great people from pop culture. Everyone from Tommy Chong to Paul Williams and Allison Arngrim and Matthew Laberto and you know um, a number of people from Sesame Street, etc. And and we also talk about some other film film topics like forgotten films jonathan and i spar back and forth about you know these sometimes terrible movies that we inflict upon each other to kind of do a retro um retro review of and, and bring up so yeah we have we have a great time it's a lot of fun so check it out it's on youtube and all the all the um yeah the audio services well, and one of the things I was watching that you and uh, and Jonathan were talking about you and like and Disney and being a part of the Disney family early on and and going to the parks um, that that must have been a huge thing for you like it being a Disney star in a Disney park. Did you literally go in the park around those times? A lot, a whole lot. Yeah, this this um, part the part of my personal collection of of Mickey Mouse memorabilia is all collected from my time spending time at Disneyland when I was a was a child. Yeah, this this one case is here. I've got a couple cases over here and another case on the other side of my my computer with with things that I purchased. I I clearly if it's not obvious, I am a Disney fan. I was a Disney fan before I uh, got to work for the studio and once uh, that was that was ba back in the day that was a perk that the studio offered if you were if you were working for them i was under contract for for disney for um three years and ended up doing six projects for them over that period of time and they um they pretty much said anytime you want to go just give us a call we'll have tickets waiting for you and so it was it was quite the thing and i i spent a lot a lot of time at at, um, at disneyland uh during the 70s yeah it was great that's awesome do you think um, you should have gotten an attraction <laughs> I should have got a what? An attraction. Which mountain? Escape attraction? Which mountain should it have well, been? Well, you an know, they, they missed they they misnamed Space Mountain. It should be which you know, <laughs> which mountain? I, I mean, but you know, hey, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be too. That's, I'm that's not spot be, on. That, I will call it that from now on. I'm going to go ride which mountain. It's very very cool. Let's make it happen. Let's just which let's mountain? start a groundswell. Yeah. Um, can I get weird for a second? Uh, sure. So I'm watching this movie, and no, Patrick, come on, please. Um, so we, I'm watching this movie, and there, you know, there's a lot of things that 
you know, on Disney Plus that they say, okay, uh, this is not, you know, this is culturally different or, you know, could tobacco uh, depictions because it's rated G. And the only thing that was a warning was the tobacco. And, and ultimately, and, you know, we'll talk about this at the end with our wrap up. I do think this stands the test of time. But there is one weird scene with Aristotle Bolt where he comes out to meet the kids uh, and he says, uh, he comes off a little creepy, I feel like. It's, you have a very beautiful niece and a most attractive nephew. And I was just like, <laughs> did people talk like that back then? <laughs> well, well, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> so I, I would say upon like examination, that. that could be considered um, cringeworthy. What I find incredibly <laughs> cringeworthy, more so than anything, is in Return from Witch Mountain when Christopher Lee first discovers me and my powers, and he, his lines are in, 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 you know, breathless desperation. I want that boy. I have to have that boy. I need that boy. <laughs> and I'm just like, going, wow, you know, at the time it didn't mean anything to me, but upon you know successive viewings it it, it kind of makes me go hmm <laughs> what, uh, what yeah. was aristotle's but, bolt's plan to monetize the kids that's what i kept trying to figure out I'm... <laughs> who knows i guess we were supposed to just find riches somewhere know where they were guide him to them let him buy them you know for nothing and then of course make yeah. a fortune reselling them or accumulating them who, who knows? Who knows? I mean, you know, well, but what would any evil person do with someone with incredible, with very valuable and, you I know, mean, he if, outlines if he actually few, had some control over that, but, uh, yeah. He outlines a few options when he talks about, you know, that yeah. Tony could walk over and find out where there was oil in the ground and things like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, but in general, though, the, when he uh, welcomes them in, he welcomes them into what's almost like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, Pleasure Island in Pinocchio. It's this wonderful, like, luring in oasis for children, this this grand nursery that he has put together for them with their own bedrooms and the marionettes and their own soda fountain, which I assume is what most kids in the 70s had in their room was their own soda fountain built in <laughs> to the place. When you walked into that room as a kid, like when you walked onto that set for the first time, were you just like blown away and said like, how much of this can I take with me? Can I live here? Or was it just, did it just feel like another set? Oh no, it was, it was, it was powerful in a very interesting way because yeah, it's a fantasy bedroom for children. And um, the funny thing was, it wasn't just like Kim and I that were enamored by it. A lot of members of the crew would walk onto that set and walk around and look at it and say, yeah, man, wouldn't this have been amazing for, you know, for a kid? And they'd say, no, it would be amazing for me now. I mean, so <laughs> it, it, it gets brought up a lot um, from, from pe people mention that all the time. It's like the, yeah. the, the dream bedroom. And in reality, it gave me ideas about how, how I kind of wanted to, I got an opportunity to design and you know put together my own special bedroom in my in my in my house and and you know I got the stereo and I had the built-ins and I the desk where I could draw and all the little 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 things that I wanted to to have not necessarily a marionette stage or a, a soda fountain but my aquarium and and it was kind of an extension of that fantasy I turned it into a little bit of a, a reality dream space for myself but it was completely inspired. Awesome by that set um so yeah it was pretty darn cool yeah yeah i think i i kind of picture that that's what patrick's basement looks like but uh you know maybe <laughs> maybe i'm wrong no i i I'm, agree i'm not it's... gonna lie when uh i i had that game show victory i did look up how much it would cost to have a coke freestyle machine in my house I really yeah. like coke patrick freestyle patrick machine. by the way ike uh one who wants to be a millionaire Oh really? Oh my gosh! Did not win. Yeah, you, you won I, money. I got a quarter million dollars. Yeah. Well, jeez, wow. Okay, yeah. all right, all right. I mean, is that not winning? That's not losing. No, I didn't win. I didn't take it all, Rob. I still there is still more money that Buena Vista Entertainment could have given me. It's never <laughs> enough for you. It is never it's enough. It's not for you. ever. Can't stop. Won't stop. You know what, Patrick? I think it's time to put you in your place. Let me ask you a couple trivia oh. questions if you got a second. Oh. 
Let me ask you a couple questions. I, you know what? And folks, I did say, by the way, please, again, if you haven't already, please like the video. Please subscribe to WDWNT TV uh, as Mr. Ike Eisman has taken his time to be with us tonight. We appreciate it. And so um, usually we ask trivia questions, and I told Ike ahead of time, you know what? You're, you're off the hook on this one. You were in this movie. You lived it. You don't need to know any of this stuff. But I, I, I said, Patrick, you know, we're going on this one. So uh, – let me ask you a couple of trivia questions. You want easy? You want super? You want softballs? What well, do you want here? Let, let's let's ramp it up. Let's ramp it up. Yeah, you want to start early. Start. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. All right. Let's say. Um. Uh, what was the name of the horse trainer at uh, at Aristotle Bolt's uh, ranch? Well, the the horses were at the. Oh yeah, it was Aristotle Bolt? The house. Bolt. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> Biff Jenkins. Yeah, Mr. Duncan. Good, good job. Good job. Um, <laughs> the 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 tow truck that that slams into the car. What was the name of the towing company, Patrick? <laughs> <laughs> I was too busy looking at. I really like how that scene was shot. They really did a good job with, like, their two shots on that scene. I thought it was really well done and well constructed. I have no idea. I can't even <laughs> picture it. I'm just glad that the chauffeur was okay. And I'm glad uh, that the kids was... checked on the chauffeur. Lloyd's Towing Company. Lloyd's wow. Towing Company. It was the tow truck. It ran wow. right into the side of the car. Um, all right, what's the cat's name? Mm. Oh, my God. Oh, no, I do know this, this. one. I know. I was it. thinking about that winky, wink, winks, winks. Wait, oh god, close, winky. Ah, oh, winky. Yeah. Your first instinct yeah. was right. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the uh, orphanage that they went to? Miss Gerties. <laughs> I hope you know the name of the orphanage that you Ms. looked at. Miss Gerties. I uh do you do you uh, remember do you remember ike no actually i'm i'm like i'm like one for four here i know winky <laughs> that's why again oh yeah uh, all right yeah. pinewood it was in uh oh, pinewood, when they drive... yes. oh god oh, yeah. so, how embarrassing so when how they drive for in... me no nah, well i mean you were only there for a minute and you had to sign yourself in i know it was probably yeah. very traumatic for you um yeah. but they they drive in you can see the side of the of uh it was a chevy van had California plates and it said Pinewood Child Welfare Department. Um, yeah. uh, so when they go to the police station, Patrick, what was what gas station was right next to the police department? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or 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 what street is the police department on? Either one. I'll I'll accept either one. You got to be kidding me. This is the hardest one in in front of our guest. <laughs> This is the hardest one you've given me. Can we go back to like what number was Troy Bolton? Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. I again, I really like that gas station scene. I, I like the way um, the actor who played Jason O'Day kind of played it. I, I like the development of that character. Um, I, you know me. Sometimes when the movie's bad, I'm on point with these because I'm like I need something to keep paying attention. But That's I good. really, I was in this movie. I was in it. So I'm, I <laughs> knew I was going to fail this That's one. a good save. Um, when uh, when they first meet uh, Jason O'Day, he's got his Winnebago parked in front of what market? Where is he picking up supplies no from? No idea, but I know that a lot of those scenes um, where the Winnebago was used, they used uh, Big Sur, that area, right? And there's like uh, the Bixby Creek Bridge, something along those lines. I got into the... The locations, I don't know why. Probably because it's really beautiful. Yeah. And I was like, oh, where's all this shot? So, yeah, I have no idea. I know he did offer Winky a can of tuna fish. Yeah, it was it was before uh, – it, yeah, uh, it was Village Market. It just says Village Market across it. I, the, it was a shell station that they were parked next to – or that the uh, police station was wow. next to, which uh, – that wow. things like that of the time really pop out to me. There's a lot of that, like, mm, nostalgia. Yeah, uh, for that kind of stuff. And there's like, you know, as they show wide shots, there's like a bowling alley. And I'm starting to think like you are about locations. Maybe I can go on a map yeah. and find out where this was because there's a bowling alley and there's a shell station. And, you know, there's a mobile down the street. And like, cause I could see like the, the, um, the horse, the Pegasus from the mobile gas. 
Um, so, so yeah, what, let's pause is... real quick for you beating me up and throw it over to Ike. What was the locations like? What was shooting this like? Because the your your bedrooms were a big sound stage, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We we and we then shot you were lots of places. Yeah, we 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 shot all around um, Carmel and um, Palo Alto, California. That was all all the exteriors, um, and yet yeah, the Pinewoods or, uh, Orphanage was in Palo Alto. It was actually a, a school um, that all those kids attended and and all the extras in those scenes were actually um students of, of the school so we shot half the um for a month we shot on location all the exteriors and then we went back to the studio to shoot all the interiors and so yes the um like the 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 sheriff's office the jail cell that was at disney studios um the marionette scene the inside of some parts of the mansion were shot back at Disney. Those, some of those scenes were actually shot inside the actual mansion itself in um, Carmel, California. And that um, that mansion is on the 16 mile drive, which is kind of a very famous uh, scenic, scenic drive in Carmel between, um, gosh, you know, forgetting the name of the famous golf course there. Um, but Probably. right, right up from Carmel, you can, you drive through all these really beautiful homes and that, and that stone castle, if you will, is actually right there. So yeah, a lot of, uh, most That's of the interiors awesome. that were shot at Walt Disney Studios. Very cool. All right, Rob, go back to beating me up. No, 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 no. You know what? The, and uh, honestly, those were the easiest ones because, uh, the security guard's name at the front gate, Marco. Uh, the, the vet oh, where they dropped off, uh, Thunderhead was Dr. Russell. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the sheriff from, uh, Longview booked them at 6, 10 AM because he made it a point to say 6, 10 AM. I don't know. why. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that. And, and uh, the final one I had for you on here, what was, what was the brand of flower? Because the flower came up a couple different times. Oh, I, oh, I looked at it. I watched it so clearly. I, Mm, I could see it. I was trying to figure out that's what the impetus of my effect question was. Cause that really did look like CG. Um, it's not King Arthur. That's a good brand of flower though. If you want to sponsor the show, King Arthur flower, uh, <laughs> King it's Arthur not flower Acme. Hour. <laughs> uh, I can't, you got me. No, it was uh, flower brand was angel white, mm. which I just, I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, you know, along the way, so so thank you for playing that game. Ike, thanks for putting up with that. I appreciate it. Sorry you had to see that <laughs> yeah, beat sure. down uh, happen. Um, <laughs> the the bear scene I thought was pretty interesting because, you know, Patrick, no, you no, talked about great. the bear earlier. It's like they're in jail, yeah. and then Tia's looking out the, uh, out the window. There just happens to be a random circus, like, cart with a bear in it. Yeah. Because why not? Yep. Um, and, with a and lock that looked like it was straight out of Pirates of the Caribbean. I look at that lock. I'm like, yeah. I've seen that lock. Yeah. So she's like, "Oh, we gotta, we gotta let the bear out." And, and Tony's got like, "We got bigger problems here. We gotta get out." And she's like, "Okay." And then she lets the bear out. And was that bear actually <laughs> following Tony and Tia? Um, th that bear is a very fascinating bear and kind of famous. Um, his name was Bruno, and he actually was uh, Gentle Ben on the TV series back in the uh, the '60s. Highly trained studio bear, um, as docile as you could possibly imagine, and um, but he, he he was getting kind of a little bit old and was was a little stubborn at times. And there's the scene where where Tia and Tony um, are going along with him, and then finally Tony says, we, "We've got to send him on. He can't. We can't. He he can't stay with us." We got to we got to move along. And he was supposed to stop and hit a mark. And he kept walking past the mark and into the camera. And we kept doing it over and over and over again. And he really wasn't getting he wasn't listening to his commands or paying attention to his trainers. And there's a moment in the film you'll see me you'll see where he walks between uh, Kim and I and uh -huh. um, he starts to continue on like he was doing for every take. And I just kind of <laughs> just kind of put my hand on his head and shoved him back and pet him and he actually stopped and did what he was supposed to do 
And so it was very, it was very interesting because that's a, that's a, he's a very, very, very big bear. And it's not like my, like I, I had any strength over him, but he somehow suddenly paid attention to me and went, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll stop now. So oh, it, like it is a random, it, it's a very random thing to discover, but obviously he's utilized as a, as a deterrent for the bad guys at a certain point later on when, when Tia telepathically calls him that to is my favorite come scene. help us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Man, I mean, you know, that's, that's this is the fun part. This, these are the fun parts about Disney movies. There's special effects, <laughs> kids, and animals, and you, yeah. you just, you, you, I, over the course of my my collective Disney career, I got to work with so many different animals, and of course, we got Thunderhead the horse, Winky the cat, we got the Bruno the bear, and you know, this was the stuff of of mythical fun for a child actor. Period. So. Just got to say, it was an incredible experience. I had so much fun, and I'm so grateful that people still enjoy the film and, you know, want to hear um, want to hear stuff about it because I love chatting about it. So wow. I appreciate when, it. Yeah, we absolutely appreciate appreciate every bit of it. Um, the but I, when I'm watching that with the bear, and I was looking at it, going, that like 2022, they wouldn't let that happen. A bear? <laughs> Were they like talking like that close to children? Like walking behind? Yeah, children, like bears. Doesn't, doesn't yeah. look like it's you know they would CGI or they would be some kind of barrier or something like that. So, um, yeah. you know, perspective, yeah. But it sounds like from your perspective, it was like made it fun. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, then you know the kids go to the um, to Hiram's house, which was again very interesting because it says Hiram O'Day on the mailbox, which I'm just like, don't they usually just put the number? Um, but it says Hiram O'Day, who is um, Jason's brother, and then they go to use his house. And when they go in and they're eating, one of the little things I noticed, and this was, again, a question that I thought only you would know the answer to this, is nowhere in the movie does Jason wear glasses. But there's one scene with Eddie Albert, which, again, icon, Eddie Albert. You're sitting there at the table with him, and he's, he's got his glasses sitting on the table. And he picks them up and holds them for a second, and then you never see him again. Hmm. I mean, was he you, was he wearing glasses on set? I mean, it seems like one of those things where, like, I was just like, wait. You know, that's that's a really good uh, good attention to detail. He did. He needed he needed reading glasses, and he probably had them on set because he was looking at his script and just left them there. And no one ever said anything because yeah, the character <laughs> did not wear glasses, so they were more than likely more than likely his, and um, just one of those things that. Either you know just, just sort of gets looked over, or um, you just don't pay that close attention to, and there it is. <laughs> well, as, and, and as I mean, and again, it's as many takes as there are in a movie, and the fact they didn't have the ability to go in and like you know take stuff out and post as like as intricate as that, maybe because he literally had mm -hmm. them on the table, he picked them up and held them for a minute, and then the next time we see a different angle, it's not there. So it may have just been yeah. like a reshoot scene or something like that. Is I'm surprised I mean, more of like that a didn't happen. Starbucks cup. In the middle of <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. one of the biggest yeah. television yes. shows around. <laughs> when when uh, Charlie and I watched Zorro uh, for Deep in the Plus last week, I there was a scene where where uh, Guy Williams comes in and there's a boom, and then you just see it for half a second. I'm like, why didn't we see more of that like all the time? Because it's just it's just again professionals and doing an amazing job, kind of like we were talking about the props earlier, is just an amazing attention to detail in this. But every now and then you find something you're like, ah, oh, that's cool. Like I wonder about that. So. Um, then they continue on and they, they're running and there, there's like this kind of big sort of just like epic ending happening because Aristotle bolts on his way in a helicopter and, uh, they're being followed in a car. And then there are these hunters that are, they're chasing after them and everybody's coming from different directions, but it all is leading to this, this final scene up on which mountain, um, in this, there's a scene with the helicopter and Ray Milland does what is a quintessential Disney reaction shot. I, 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 mm -hmm. I, Patrick, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, so yeah. he's sitting in there, the Winnebago is flying, and, and he kind of does one of these to the side, and it's like, huh. Hmm. Like, I mean, just another take that you would never, uh, that you would never see. And, and I was just like, I was like, that to me feels like a very Disney moment. Is yeah. like, you know, oh. as he's kind of like, wait a minute, what is, that's a flying Winnebago. And then it's like this, there's this whole scene with like, no, they're upside down. No, we're upside down. Um, they, but <laughs> they that to me was very Disney. of Herbie. 
It reminded yeah. me a lot of Herbie with that. Very, yeah. very Herbie-esque. Um, that, man, that last, like, quarter of the film was so good. The bear's in the car. The helicopter's upside down. And it's just, like, it's all building towards it. It felt very Superman at the time. It's funny you mentioned uh, comic book characters before, Rob, because it, it, this really felt a lot like Superman to me. Like, two super kids and their planet needed help. Um but that that end, it managed to balance cool effects, comedy, and it's still really serious, and and it's a family reunion. So I man, I dug it. I went into this liking, ended up liking this way more than I thought I was gonna. Mm. And now I wonder what I feel about bed knobs and broomsticks. I guess I'll have to <laughs> look into that one day. <laughs> Well, yeah. So here's the other thing about the very end is they finally meet up with Uncle Benet, and they thought Uncle Benet was lost to them. And they've put, been putting things in, in – in as like as the movie goes on, they learn more and more. They remember more and more, and they get – they caught up with Uncle, Uncle Benet, and immediately – and I didn't remember Denver Pyle being in this movie, but immediately it snaps. I go, that's Uncle Jesse. Mm-hmm. That is Uncle Jesse from Dukes of Hazard. And I was like – and my wife's like, mm, I don't think so. I was like – yeah, it's definitely Uncle Jesse. I mean, he had that same kind of demeanor with the kids, and um, it was just uh, – that that was, to me, I was just like, wait a minute. He's in this too? I mean, there were a lot of huge stars of the time in this movie, I feel like. you know, Again, we've got mm-hmm. a Bond villain, and then you've got Uncle Jesse. And, I mean, so I, mean, I, I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool, but, I mean, was was he – it feels like there weren't many scenes with him, though. Did they just bring him in at the end to do stuff, or did you guys shoot that out of order and spend some well, time? Well, no, they brought him, they they brought him in specifically for um, for that role. And and um, the the funny story about it is he was not originally cast. They had cast another actor, not a known actor, um, to play Uncle Benet, who showed up on set and he had this big white mane of hair and this big flowing beard and and. He looked, I swear to you, he looked like the real life Santa Claus. He was just an incredible <laughs> looking character, but he was, his behavior was particularly odd and we weren't sure what was going on with him. And we were trying to do rehearsals for the scene where Uncle Benet comes out of the, from under the tree. And then we run down to say, to, to, to meet him. And, um, and when we, we tried to shoot the first take, he we went running down to him he came running up and he stumbled and all of a sudden he fell backwards and started rolling down the hill and we thought okay that's really weird he'd been acting odd the entire time and so john huff the director and the some crew members went down to make sure he was okay stood him up and all of a sudden the first ad called for a wrap on the day and it turns out the guy was drunk he was absolutely completely drunk he just showed up on set three sheets to the wind wow. and was unable to work with us. So they had to fire him and then they needed to hire someone else and get them up within the next couple of days. And it ended up being Den- Denver Pyle. So Denver Pyle was the replacement for uncle Benet. <laughs> but I, I think at the end of, at the end of it all, he was fantastic. He was just a great, he just had a great sense about him that certainly this other actor didn't have drunk or, or not. So it ended up working out better for the movie. <laughs> Um, and again, I, I, I think that the, the surprise ending with the ship going off and, you know, and, and uncle Benet saying, Hey, we, we need everybody there because they need to see this so that they know that they're not going to chase after you again. It made total sense. The writing was tight on this. Mm -hmm. It was like it, it, they, they made sense like, Hey, otherwise, you know, Aristotle Bolt's going to go after these kids forever. They're going to go off in this ship, whether we don't know where they're going and then the kind of ship comes back around and Jason kind of smiles and, you know, but it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you kind of thought of everything when you're checking the boxes here. So, yeah. Uh, let me ask you about another thing, which, um, you know, you guys did um, uh, escape to Witch Mountain, return from Witch Mountain. And you mentioned that with Betty Davis. Um you know, that one is one that maybe, like, down the road, if we haven't scared you off enough, maybe, like, in a year or so or next week, I don't care, you would come back and talk to us about that one. But, but you did a movie that I believe you directed, The Blair Witch Mountain Project? It was just, yeah, it was a, it was a short film um, that was actually a spoof of The Blair Witch Project, <clears throat> 
which when that when that when that film came out this rash of spoofs were being done short films little five five minute films six minute films spoofing the movie using all the odd uh conventions and 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 you know set pieces from the blair witch project and i don't know why all of a sudden i was i was watching and like it was entertainment tonight or some some program they were talking about all of when i thought hmm, the blair and it just rolled off my tongue the blair witch mountain project oh wow that could be really funny and so i ended up writing this script and and um and shot it back in the early days of digital video got got kim to participate in it with me and uh yeah it was it was a it was a really just fun spoof about about a um broadcast wannabe broadcast journalist who was on a on a quest to find the real tony and tia and and so she goes off on this whole adventure but of course it follows a lot of the set pieces from the blair witch project and and um you know has a very funny payoff at the at the end where she actually finally meets kim and i or the or tony and tia and she gets a gets us all confused so it was really a lot of fun um and um got actually picked by this uh, this film group as, as one of the top 10 Blair Witch spoofs of the 273 that were made at the time. Wow. So I felt very proud of that. So wow. yeah, you should be. That's awesome. So yeah, it's, <clears throat> if you've seen the Blair Witch Project, you can watch it and you'll get all the jokes. Uh, if you haven't, you might not get the oddities to it, but um, it, really, it, it, it really is a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, and then uh, there was the Eric Von Detten remake that apparently they've buried because that's not on uh, Disney Plus. And then there's uh, the Race mm. to Witch Mountain, as as, uh, as Patrick mentioned earlier, which you and Kim both did a, a cameo in this one, uh, this mm -hmm. later remake in uh, 2009 with The Rock. Um, was that was it cool to revisit this this movie, but be in a kind of a different role? Oh, it was it was truly lovely. Um, because I, I, I was very excited that they were finally doing it because there had been rumors running around Hollywood for at least 10 years about Disney wanting to do a remake of, of some kind. And we kept, I kept hearing about scripts that were that would come around and Disney would turn them down. And it went through a bunch of iterations um, for quite a long time until finally one day I got a phone call from Andy Fickman, the director, who said, We've, you know, we're we're doing the, this remake. I'm call it's actually in a, a reimagining, and we've got a role in it that we would love to have you play. It's not necessarily Tony. It could be Tony, maybe not Tony, but we'd love for you to be in it. And would you like to do it? And I said, of course I would. And my first question was, is Kim doing it? Because I don't you see how you can do it without Kim. And he said, oh yeah, she's on board. You know, the, you guys, you guys have your scenes together. And um, and I said, absolutely, I'm 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 in. So. When I flew out to shoot it, um, it was just kind of really overwhelming because Andy had warned me that everyone working on the movie was actually a, an Escape to Witch Mountain fan. And everyone was so excited to meet Kim and I and have us there and be a part of it. Oh. And even Dwayne Johnson, who's just like the greatest, one of the greatest people in Hollywood I've, I've absolutely ever met. He, he was so incredibly gracious and talked about how much he enjoyed the movie and how excited he was to have us. Uh, be a part of it and so it was it was surreal in a way because you know here I am coming down to work on a on a Disney remake of my classic Disney movie but it was almost like it was almost like a like a weird fan fiction project you know they were they were all fans and then making this Witch Mountain style story and and and, and then finally we all finally got down to business and went to work and I said thank goodness because all this all this attention was made, just made, it was very <laughs> special and lovely but it started to make me feel strange and, and almost a little bit uncomfortable because I'm not used to all of that because it was it came from everywhere and and so um, it, it, it was surreal it was so much fun to do it was a great week that we all um, spent doing our, 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 our scenes and and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be able to say as a part of my, um, you know, my resume and my roster of films that there is actually a, a remake of a movie that, you know, Kim and I did together so many years ago and, and that, that Disney saw fit to actually bring it back to the screen in another form because it's so, it's so well loved and, and thought of and that means a great deal to me, it really does. 
Yeah, absolutely. What we're uh, what we're seeing a lot of now is these well loved projects are coming back as Disney Plus television series. Mm. Could you see something for which Mountain as a television series? Would you want to be a part of it? Is there story still meat on that bone, or would it just be introducing the story to a new generation? <clears throat> I don't. You know, I. I don't really know how to if if I have if I'm in a position to qualify that in any way. I know how hard it was for the producers of Race to Witch Mountain to come up with a storyline that they thought would make sense, and and you know sometimes there's there's definitely material there that you can mine, um, but um, you know I don't know if that's necessarily the case anymore. And um, and if someone wanted me to be a part of something like that, it would be of course be honored and, and thrilled to be asked um even though i'm happily retired and i <laughs> don't feel much like working anymore other than doing these uh, these, these fun shows but uh you know you, you never say never and you just you you never know so they're they're yeah you never know you just never know yeah yeah, well, I, I we we've already kept you longer than we should, and yet never, uh, not even nearly as long as Patrick and I would love to. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but but for everybody else, uh, thank you uh, for watching. I, I just want to remind you, you can find uh, find Ike on Instagram. He's got uh, Ike underscore Eisen, uh, Eisenman at Instagram. Uh, on Twitter, I love this Twitter header that says, "Hey Tia, guess what? I'm on Twitter now." <laughs> that is freaking Thank awesome. You. I don't know. I don't know how many people actually really noticed that, but I thought, you know, we're gonna have some fun with this. <laughs> no, I love it. And then also uh, on Facebook. So, uh, man, it has been an honor and a privilege to talk to you. Normally, we would say, "Would you recommend this?" Of course, we would recommend this movie. That's usually our 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 hook is that we would normally at the end say, "Would you recommend this movie?" Um, Patrick, do you have like final thoughts about the movie in general though absolutely um i number one what a privilege thank you so much for being a part of the show we love having people with that insight come in here when you do these projects it's really great when you authentically like something because then you can gush about it you can talk about it i had no idea how i was going to feel rewatching this again might have got it confused with some other disney classics I absolutely love this movie and I'm sad I didn't watch it with my daughter because I think this is something that she would like as well. She's three. She's starting to like when you get a little bit of attention uh, in the movies and I'm very excited to show this to her. Um, there's something about this classic Disney filmmaking that just allows the project to feel timeless. And like everybody's been saying, this holds up. There's nothing wrong with this. We wouldn't need to go and replace this attraction later on because it's awful. This is a, a good, wholesome story that I think uh, people of all ages can enjoy. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I, I would say the thing that we always say a lot, Ike, is we're like, is does it stand the test of time? And like you said, Patrick, when it's well made, it does stand the test of time. Um, one of the things that I'm enamored by, and it's not just because you're here, Ike, is the, the, the acting uh, for the kids. Because a lot of times the kid actors don't really hold the movie. I think the kids held their own with this one, especially for a movie that, you know, they're carrying from character to character. So, uh, you know, watching it, I think the effects hold up. I think that the story is really well written uh, to a point that that's one of the things I'm really noticing these days is how how is the script done and and does the story make sense and I feel like there's a lot of that here so um, I, I again I've really really enjoyed doing uh, like going back into this because as a kid I loved it I think I saw it and then I saw it again and then I bookmarked it in my head as yep that's one of my favorites and now to be able to go back to it and go yep it is still one of my favorites there are things like again I love superheroes. <clears throat> the Greatest American Hero, uh, I don't know if you all remember that show from the 80s, does oh, yeah. not hold up. Does not <laughs> hold up. So don't go back and watch Mr. Hinckley. Theme song's Mr. still good. <laughs> theme song's still real good, though. Oh, no, Joey Scarberry yeah. for life. No, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just that's saying, a great like, theme, theme yeah, song. you go back, right. you go back to that where they went, like, because you know Hinckley was the guy that shot Reagan, so they changed it to Mr. H and then Mr. Hanley, and it's just like, what are you guys doing here? And yeah, so it doesn't really stand up. But I can. Any other things that you'd like to to share with the folks before you we uh, we sign off? No, I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me, and and um, it was a real pleasure. And and as I said, it, I I enjoy I enjoy. Um, telling stories from from uh, from working on the film it was it was really an, an incredible experience and and i'm i'm just so happy that it, it's uh it is a a long-lasting uh piece of disney 
um, Disney history for, for everyone. So thanks for having me and thanks for listening and, and uh, I appreciate it. Well, make then, sure you go head over to Pop Culture Retro, get that on your podcaster, yeah, add it yeah. here on YouTube. Make sure you like and subscribe to him, to us. <laughs> thank Again, you. Yes. Very thank fragile you. ego here. Very fragile yeah. ego. I need the likes. Yeah, I live absolutely. for them. No, there were some people in chat already saying, yep, I'm already signed up. They signed up for, they subscribed on YouTube and they subscribe uh, on the podcast. So, yeah, awesome. it's definitely. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate great it. Great content. So. Uh, hang on for just a second, Ike. Thank you guys so much for watching us. We appreciate it. We will uh, see you next time. Have a great week, everyone.